Taking bites and making sleep appliances is really easy. We've all been doing it for years. I can teach you what you need to know about making appliances and taking bites for sleep in about 10 minutes. That's not the issue. It's what comes before and what comes after. You are going to need to evaluate the patient for things that the sleep lab and the physician are going to miss. And if you only look at it as, well, I'm doing an appliance, number one, you're going to have a, a monumental percentage of failures. Number two, you're not going to look professional to your patients. And number three, you're not going to look, look professional to your referring physicians. So a lot of the information I'm going to give you is so you can see your patient as a whole and deal with some things that you might not have thought, out, thought of. Make yourself look good to the physicians. Um, the last thought is that your physicians and your patients really need you to be more than a dispenser of appliances. Uh, the way medicine handles these patients currently is very rapid fire. They will have a short exposure to the physician, they'll have a sleep lab or, or an at-home study, and there are so many more uh, facets to dental sleep medicine and the problems people run into that you may be the last chance to find some issues that can make CPAP work for the person, that can make sleep appliances work for the person, and this is truly a life-changing uh, a life-changing field. There are two things, three things in um, dentistry that I think are miracles. Number one, someone can come in in uh, pain from a tooth needing a root canal and we can get them out of pain and that's a miracle. Number two, we have people who can't face the world because of their dental problems and we can make it possible that for them to smile and face the world. And the third miracle for me, and I apologize because sometimes I will tear up at some of this, is we have people that have not been able to have a decent life and enjoy life because they are so exhausted, so fatigued, so hurting that they can't participate in life and they don't know what to do and we can help them in dental sleep medicine feel like a new person and we all have areas in dentistry where we wish we could have done better over the years when <sighs> sorry when you can give back to people their life it is a wonderful thing and it makes up for a lot of the things we wish we could have done better throughout our careers. So um, with those thoughts in mind, my information and I hope you enjoy it. Dental sleep medicine and oral appliances for the management of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. The most important part of that is the dental sleep medicine before providing an appliance. Um, I practice locally, we've all got bios and CE, and so right on to sleep. One of the things, and I'll be throwing out some ideas that, that I would really like you to throw out to your physicians and your patients so they get a feeling you know what you're talking about and you're not simply a dispenser of an oral appliance. There is no grand unified theory of functional purpose for sleep. There are some people like David Rye at Emory and uh, Dr. Gieselsen in Ireland who, I mean in Iceland, who are studying the genetic basis in flies and higher organisms of why we developed sleep. And we obviously need the growth hormone release, the health restorative measures, the metabolic recuperation. We need to put the previous day behind us, let thoughts reorganize, 
during that period of sleep. So there are a lot of purposes for sleep, but there's no grand theory as to how it developed, why it developed, and what its major purpose is. All these things happen, but no grand unified theory as to how and why. Why do we have sleep apnea where a lot of other organisms do not? During evolution, uh, our brain size increased, the cranial vault increased, and as that happened, the face became lower on the skull, and so the face occupies more of the airway, and the airway is now more compromised. Um, when you speak of obstructive sleep apnea, you're looking at the genetics of the airway, the anatomic, but also the expression of that, those genetics, the epigenetics, and that is we are finding that there is a difference in the musculature. There's a difference in the genetics of the muscles of those who are prone to sleep apnea and those who are not. There's a difference in the genetics of the obesity that results in obstructive sleep apnea. So, just some interesting studies being done there. Um, <clears throat> Muscle weakness, much more common in people who are prone to obstructive sleep apnea, and that's a function of the genetics of the, the makeup of the uh, muscles of the tongue and the airway. Obesity, obviously a factor in compromising the airway. What is obstructive sleep apnea? And I'll lapse into just calling it OSA. Uh, that's how I think of it. It's the most common form of sleep apnea basically in which someone is trying to breathe in, there's an obstruction in the airway, and the body cannot move air into the lungs. Apnea means without breath. Disruption of sleep is caused by the repeated periods of oxygen deprivation. So the body has to wake up. And if anyone's trying to figure out how to use the handouts, they're designed flip chart wise, so you can uh, get from one page to the next, hole punch them and use them. So if you're trying to figure out which way to turn them, that's how. Um, disruption of sleep is caused by the fact that when the body can't breathe because the muscles are collapsed, the body arouses, the brain arouses the body, and you develop tone in the muscles to open the airway. Uh, these repeated arousals keep patients from ever getting into the deeper layers of sleep or the deeper levels of sleep in which rest and recuperation occur. Without rest, without normal sleep, the patient is never rested, alert, stable, and physically refreshed. One of the worst feelings is to wake up each morning never having slept and left the, day behind, the, the last day behind you. And one of the things people will tell you about sleep apnea is they never feel like they've shut off the body and the mind, so they're starting the day fresh from the one before. And that's a very tiring feeling, and I went through it for years before I finally treated myself that I should have done years earlier, and it's all the difference in the world. Normal sleep, basically, you have, most people need about seven and a half to eight hours of sleep. Each normal sleep cycle is about 90 minutes, and five of those cycles is about seven and a half hours. And it's, it's fairly regular. So normally people fall asleep in 10 minutes, that's referred to, the, referred to as the sleep latency. And in the normal structure, non-REM stay, non-REM light sleep, 5%, non-REM deeper sleep, 50%, non-REM the deepest sleep, 20%, and then waking a little bit for REM sleep. Just another view of this, you have stage W, which is wakefulness, you have the uh, three stages of non-REM sleep, if people are confused. This stage three used to be called um, formally stages three and four of sleep, and they're changing that slightly, and stage R, which is REM sleep. And again, your percentage um, is five, 50, 20, and then rapid eye movement sleep. One of the things that hurt uh, in obstructive sleep apnea is that we tend to get a lot of uh, non-REM 1 and non-REM 2, but not a lot of non-REM 3 and REM sleep. And if you don't get those, you'll never feel rested.